In the 1970s and 80s, if you boarded a long-haul flight, there was almost a 50% chance you were stepping onto a trijet. Three engines powered legends like the DC-10 and the L-1011 TriStar. These were the aircraft that could cross oceans nonstop, land in zero visibility, and were trusted by passengers as safer than twin jets. But if they were so advanced and relied on by airlines worldwide, why don't we see a single Tri-J in the skies today? The problem? In the 1960s. The 1960s were the golden age of commercial aviation. At least that's how it looked on the surface. Jetliners had replaced the piston-driven planes of the 1950s. And for the first time, millions of everyday travelers were flying across continents instead of crossing them by ship. Airports were expanding, airlines were competing for prestige, and the world suddenly felt a whole lot smaller. But beneath that excitement, there was a massive technical and regulatory challenge. Crossing long stretches of water or remote land was not as simple as buying a ticket and boarding a jet. Regulators cared about one thing more than anything else, redundancy. It's because jet engines in the 1960s, as impressive as they looked, were not the paragons of reliability we know today. Failures happened so many times, and when you are flying over the Atlantic or Pacific, you cannot exactly pull over on the side of the road. So the FAA introduced the 60-minute rule. That meant any twin-engine jet had to stay within one hour's flying time of a diversion airport. You could zigzag over land, but an ocean crossing was out of the question. This rule changed everything. Airlines that wanted to cross oceans or fly remote polar routes had to use four-engine jets like the Boeing 707 or the Douglas DC-8. These quad jets were beasts of engineering, and they got the job done, but they were expensive. Each extra engine meant more fuel burned, more weight to carry, and more maintenance. It's like airlines were being punished for following the rules, and the irony was that the passengers loved those big four-engine machines. In fact, people equated more engines with more safety. It was comforting to look out the window and see four power plants humming away. Airlines even used that perception in their marketing. But behind the curtain, airline accountants were not happy with the situation. Operating four engines for every single trip was pushing costs through the roof. By the mid-1960s, the industry was at a crossroads. Passenger traffic was growing like crazy. It was almost doubling every 10 years, and the Boeing 747 was about to appear on the horizon. But the 747, as revolutionary as it was, was not the answer for every airline. It was too big, too costly, and too much plain for medium and long haul routes that didn't always fill a jumbo jet. Airlines needed something in between. They needed something smaller than a 747, but capable of flying over oceans something safer than a twin jet under the rules and more efficient than a quad jet. They had twin engine aircraft, which were cheaper but banned from long haul routes. And they had four engine aircraft, which were legal for oceans, but heavy, fuel hungry, and expensive. Airlines wanted a sweet spot, a plane with enough redundancy for regulators and enough efficiency for their bottom line. That was the exact pressure cooker that gave birth to the idea of the Trijet. Three engines seemed like the magic compromise. They were safe enough to cross oceans under FAA rules, but lighter and cheaper to operate than the big four. It was a solution tailor-made for its time, and it was about to reshape aviation in the 1970s. The Trijet Revolution. The first big breakthrough came from Boeing in the early 1960s, when they launched the Boeing 727 in 1963. The design was impressive to look at. It had three engines mounted at the rear, with the number two engine fed through an S-duct that curved elegantly into the tail. That arrangement freed up the wings, which made them cleaner aerodynamically and gave the aircraft great performance on short runways. It also kept the engines low to the ground for easier maintenance compared to larger jets. The 727 could do things other jets of its size simply couldn't. It was designed to serve airports that didn't have the infrastructure for giants like the 707. That meant places with shorter, narrower runways or high altitude airports where thinner air made takeoffs tricky. With its extra thrust and high lift wing design, the 727 could operate almost anywhere, and airlines loved that flexibility. Eastern Airlines became the launch customer, but soon United, American, Delta, and nearly every major US carrier added 727s to their fleets. Internationally, it was the same story. Lufthansa, Japan Airlines, British Airways, everyone wanted the jet that could land where others couldn't. The numbers speak for themselves. 1,832 Boeing 727s were built, making it the most produced trije in history. For two decades, it dominated short and medium haul routes around the world. 
Whether you are flying from Chicago to New York or hopping between European capitals, chances are you boarded a 727. It also had a cultural impact. For many travelers of the 1970s and 80s, the 727 was air travel. Its distinctive T-tail and rear-mounted engines made it instantly recognizable. Pilots called it a rocket for its climb performance, while passengers enjoyed the quiet cabin up front away from those tail-mounted engines. It was practical, efficient, and iconic. But while the 727 proved the concept of three engines worked, it was the wide-body trijets that took the revolution global. McDonnell Douglas stepped into the wide-body race with the DC-10. This took its first flight in 1970. Unlike the 727, this was no short-haul specialist. The DC-10 was built for medium and long-haul routes, carrying between 270 and 380 passengers depending on the variant. The configuration was classic tri two engines under the wings and one mounted on the tail. This setup balanced the aircraft well and gave it redundancy for over-ocean flying. Airlines could finally operate long-haul routes with fewer engines than the expensive quad jets. The DC-10 came in multiple versions to suit different markets. The DC-1010 was designed specifically for U.S. domestic routes. The DC-1030 and DC-1040 had longer range and more powerful engines. This made them capable of true intercontinental service. Cargo operators also loved the design because the wide fuselage and strong floor made it easy to convert into freighters, and FedEx and UPS would later become some of the largest DC-10 operators in the world. Airlines adopted the DC-10 rapidly. United Airlines was the launch customer, but soon carriers across Europe, Asia, and the Middle East were buying in. The DC-10 gave them a long-haul plane that didn't bleed money like a 747, but could still serve busy routes efficiently. Technically, the DC-10 was not as advanced as its rival, the L1011 TriStar, but it was simpler, easier to produce, and more adaptable. That practicality made it attractive, and over its production run, 386 DC-10s were built. Now what about its rival, the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar? Launched in 1972, the L-1011 TriStar was Lockheed's first commercial airliner in years, and they pulled out all the stops to make it shine. The TriStar earned its reputation as the Rolls-Royce of the skies, and that wasn't just a marketing line. It was powered by Rolls-Royce RB211 engines, an advanced high-bypass turbofan that delivered excellent efficiency and low noise for its time. The catch here was that Rolls-Royce nearly went bankrupt developing it, which delayed the TriStar's entry and hurt sales. Still, the technology was years ahead. The L1011 featured the first certified Autoland system in a commercial jet. It was capable of Category 3C landings, which meant it could land itself in zero visibility, a game-changing safety advantage. Not only that, it had an advanced flight deck with autoflight systems and flight management tools that pilots praised for reducing workload. Plus, it boasted exceptional handling. Pilots often described it as one of the smoothest and most forgiving wide bodies ever built. Its third engine was integrated with an elegant S-duct through the tail, just like the 727, but on a larger scale. It wasn't the simplest engineering solution, but it looked sleek and fed the tail engine with an efficient airflow. Airlines that flew the L1011 swore by its comfort and reliability. Eastern Airlines, TWA, Delta, and British Airways were some of the biggest operators. In fact, British Airways chose the L1011 over the DC-10 partly because of its reputation for safety and sophistication. But while it won the praise of pilots and passengers, the TriStar never matched the DC-10 in sales. Rolls-Royce's financial troubles meant production was delayed just as the DC-10 was gaining market share. By the time Lockheed got going, the DC-10 had already locked in many of the big airline orders. In total, just 250 L-101s were built, compared to nearly 400 DC-10s. Still, for those who flew it, the TriStar was something special. Even today, retired pilots call it one of the finest airliners ever built, a machine that combined technology, elegance, and safety like no other. Together, the 727, DC-10, and L-1011 reshaped aviation in the 1970s. The 727 dominated short and medium routes, while the wide-body Tri-Js opened up transatlantic and trans-Pacific flying for airlines that couldn't justify a 747. And for passengers, this was the golden era of the Tri-J. Boarding a flight in the 1970s or 80s meant there was nearly a coin flip chance you were stepping onto a three-engine jet. 
Airlines marketed them as the perfect balance of safety and efficiency. Passengers believed them, and for a time, they were right. Three engines solved the regulatory restrictions of the 1960s and gave airlines the flexibility they had never had before. The Tri-J became aviation's middle child. Not as big as the jumbo jets, not as cheap as the twins, but seemingly the perfect compromise. Of course, history would prove otherwise. For a while, it really did seem like three was the magic number, but the same third engine that once made these planes essential eventually became the reason they disappeared. Why the third engine became a liability. Mounting a third engine might sound simple and easy to do. Just stick one in the tail and call it a day. In practice, it was a nightmare of design compromises. Take the Lockheed L1011 TriStar. Its engineers had to figure out how to feed clean air into an engine buried inside the vertical stabilizer. Their solution was the now famous S-duct, which was a long, curving intake that snaked through the tail before reaching the engine. It looked futuristic and it worked, but it added weight, complexity, and drag. Every extra pound meant less payload or higher fuel burn. And for airlines, those pounds meant they had to spend more dollars. The McDonnell Douglas DC-10 went for a simpler approach. They featured a straight intake mounted high on the fuselage that fed directly into the tail engine. It avoided the heavy curves of the S-duct but created its own problems. That high mounted intake could disrupt airflow and the structural design made the aircraft sensitive to certain failure modes, especially in the event of an engine separation. Then there was the Boeing 727. With three engines clustered at the back, maintenance crews were forced to work in cramped spaces, especially on the center engine hidden inside the tail. That engine was suspended almost 30 feet above the ground, meaning you couldn't even reach it without specialized lifts. A simple engine swap that might take hours on a twin jet could drag into days on a trijet. Time is money in aviation, and those maintenance hours were costing airlines dearly. It wasn't just about fixing engines either. The third engine required extra fuel lines, more hydraulics, more controls in the cockpit, and more redundancy systems. Every extra component was another potential point of failure and another item to inspect. So while three engines gave regulatory freedom, they also made life harder for airlines. One of the turning points came on May 25, 1979. American Airlines Flight 191, a DC-10, took off from Chicago O'Hare when its left engine separated from the wing. In the process, hydraulic lines were severed, wing slats retracted, and the aircraft rolled uncontrollably before crashing, killing all 271 people on board and two on the ground. Now, to be clear, this was not an inherent flaw in the Tri-J concept. Investigators traced it back to improper maintenance procedures during engine installation, but the damage was done. The accident became the deadliest in U.S. aviation history at the time, and the DC-10's reputation never fully recovered. And that's the irony. The third engine, meant to represent safety and security, instead became associated with complexity and high-profile failures. For airlines already questioning the economics, this was one more reason to reconsider. While engineers wrestled with maintenance and regulators scrutinized safety, something else was happening in the background. Twin jet engines were getting better. By the 1980s, the average time between engine failures had skyrocketed compared to the 1960s. Technology had advanced so much that two engines could now be trusted on routes that once required three or four. Regulators started to take notice. In 1985, the FAA approved ETOPS 120, which is Extended Range Twin Engine Operational Performance Standards. For the first time, twin jets like the Boeing 767 could fly up to 120 minutes away from a diversion airport. Just three years later, that was extended to ETOPS 180 unlocking almost every transatlantic route. This was a body blow to the Trijet. The very reason for its existence was being more capable than a twin jet, and now it was gone. Why pay for a third engine and the maintenance that came with it when two engines could legally and safely do the same job? And the mind-blowing thing is that a single GE9X engine on today's Boeing 77X produces over 134,000 pounds of thrust. This is more than all three engines on a DC-10 combined. That's totally a revolution. Now airlines live and die by the numbers. And by the 1990s, the numbers told a brutal story. A DC-1030 burned more fuel per hour than a Boeing 767-300ER. Despite carrying a similar number of passengers, over the lifespan of an aircraft, that difference added up to tens of millions of dollars in extra operating costs. Then, there were higher maintenance bills of a third engine. 
which is why the Tri-J no longer made sense. McDonnell Douglas tried to adapt with the MD-11, which was a stretched and modernized version of the DC-10. It came with winglets, more efficient engines, and promises of incredible performance. But the reality didn't match the marketing. The MD-11 consistently fell short of its advertised range and fuel efficiency. Airlines like Singapore Airlines and Delta were unimpressed, and orders dried up. In the end, only about 200 MD-11s were built before production shut down in 2000. Even cargo carriers, who initially loved tri-jets for their payload capacity, started switching to twins. FedEx was once the world's largest DC-10 and MD-11 operator, but it began replacing them with 767 freighters. Now, while airlines crunched numbers, passengers were going through their own psychological shift. For decades, engine count equaled safety. People felt reassured flying on a jumbo jet with four engines or a trije with three. But by the 2000s, twin jets had proven themselves on ultra-long routes, flying 15 hours over oceans without incident. The data was undeniable. The chance of a dual engine failure on a twin jet was actually lower than losing two engines on a trij. A Boeing 777 could log over 100,000 flight hours without a single in-flight shutdown. Passengers eventually stopped asking what would happen if both engines failed. Instead, they started focusing on things like seat comfort, entertainment screens, and Wi-Fi. The psychological advantage of a third engine evaporated. By the 1990s and 2000s, the writing was on the wall. Airlines retired their DC-10s and L-1011s in favor of 767s, 777s, and Airbus A330. KLM flew the final passenger MD-11 flight in 2014, marking the end of an era. Today, you will only see Tri-Js flying cargo routes, aerial firefighting missions, or serving as test beds for aerospace programs. Most ended up in desert boneyards, their paint fading under the sun, and the sad part is that the pilots who flew them still talk about tri jates with reverence. Many call the L1011 the smoothest, most forgiving jet they have ever flown. They admit modern twins are efficient, but they say those planes lack the soul of the tri jays But nostalgia doesn't pay the bills. In the harsh world of commercial aviation, efficiency always wins. Now tell us, did you ever fly on a tri jay And what do you remember most about it? Share your experience with us in the comments below. And before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss the latest aviation updates. We will keep you in the loop. Goodbye for now.